there are two things among many that I love in this world, okay? I love movies and I love free stuff. Anybody with me on that? Oh my gosh, yes. Mm. It's the best because it's free and the stuffness of it all is so good. And so I love going to the movies when I can. It's not super often that I actually get like out. Uh, but that's okay because we live in a world with the magic of Redbox. And since I love free stuff, that's even cheaper, right? Uh, so I have no problem with that. Or, you know, if I'm really feeling cheap, then there's always when it shows up in my home via the magic of Netflix. Yeah, so... Uh, it turns out that I am at an age in my life where I have more patience than extra cash, and so I'm good with that. Uh, it might happen to you one day, too. But once in a while, you know, we manage to get out of the house. We'll splurge on the date night, you know, pay for the babysitter and the movie tickets and the popcorn and the soda and the candy in my purse. We don't do that. Uh, but we'll head out, especially if it's like a really big deal, you know, like if it has Star Wars in the title. Duh. Right. Or if it was made by Pixar, that's kind of a must-see thing for us. Yeah, okay, you too? Okay, great, yeah. So back in the day, uh, before my husband was my husband, we were on one such hot date to the movies. We were actually engaged. And since we don't go very often, we decided that we were going to treat ourselves, okay? Because when you walk through those doors and you just get hit with that wall of buttery heaven, and then you see that soda machine from the future, right, where you can get literally any kind of beverage you want, and of course you get your favorite because it's your favorite, but you got options, right? And so we were scanning the price list and, you know, for only 30 cents more, you can get refills, so we walked away from that counter with this. Yeah. That photo is to scale, okay? Yeah. I'm just kidding. It's not. Okay. So we took that bad boy down before the previews had even finished. And, and David looked at me and he asked, hey, do you want me to go refill it? And I was like, no, man, that's like half my weight in popcorn. I'm good. Okay, so we're just, movie starts, and about halfway through, a little more or so, uh, the soda was empty, and the popcorn, it had been so salty, and we had paid extra for free refill, so I looked over at this excellent human being, and I said, hey, would you mind stepping out and topping off the Diet Coke? And he kind of looked at the screen and looked at me and looked back at the screen and was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, I mean, come on, please, you know, you'll only be gone, what, like three minutes max, and I'll catch you up on what happens, it'll be fine. And so... This phenomenal human being that I get to call mine, he picked up that empty cup, he stepped out into the lobby, and then this is what happened. So he walks back into the theater, and literally everyone is crying. And he turns to me and he goes, what happened? And I just said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I can't believe he still married me after that. <sighs> it's an amazing movie moment, right? And it seems like all of our favorite movies, all these great stories, they follow the same narrative, right? Our heroes, they, they lay down their lives so that others may live. We see it play out all the time. It happens in Harry Potter. It happens in Star Wars. It happens in Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah. Happens in the Hunger Games, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Ooh. Mm. Yes. And of course, of course, everyone's favorite, Bing Bong, right? Yes. Okay, so these great heroes, we love it. Man, this same story gets told over and over again, and we just eat it up. We love when it happens. Our heroes lay down their lives so that others may live. If it sounds familiar, it's because you've heard it before, I'm sure. John 3.16 is the greatest story ever told. You've seen it at sporting events on signs written across Tim Tebow's cheeks, right? Because it's a really big deal, this story of how God sent his only son for us. Sent his son to show us how to live, to teach us how to die. To die in a brutal, horrible way, but then come back three days later, right? Appear to his disciples resurrected for a couple of glorious weeks and then ascend into heaven and he's going to come back again. We know the story. We've heard it, right? We never get tired of seeing versions of the story play out on the big screen. But sometimes when it comes to the original, I feel like it can lose a little bit of its freshness. You know? I mean, we, 
Crucifixes are nothing new. Some of you are wearing them on your t-shirts, right? Some of you have them around your necks. We hang them in our homes, right? We make the sign of the cross when we say a prayer. The crucifix hangs in our Catholic churches. We, we see it all the time, but I think that a lot of times it can lose its impact. There's this temptation to think that because we've heard the story so many times before that there's nothing new that God wants to say to us about it. But our God is always in the business of making things new. And there's something new that he has for each one of us as we consider the cross. Tonight, we're talking about the cross and how God ultimately reveals his love for us. And there are, of course, so many ways that God shows us that he loves us, but there's a reason we always come back to the cross. St. Paul calls it the proof of God's love for us. It's the center of our faith, this moment where God's son suffered and died and rose again for us. Last night we talked about the love of God the Father, the kind of love that would do anything for his children, whether they're prodigal or not, right? And we get to experience that love as his adopted sons and daughters. See, that father who loved us so much sent his son into the world for us, and then his son chose to suffer for us. He was beaten and spit upon and whipped and stripped naked and hung up on a hunk of wood with the expectation that his lungs would fill with blood and he would suffocate and die. The crucifixes that we see in our churches, they don't do justice to what he really endured for us. And not just the excruciating physical pain of being crucified, but the emotional pain of being separated from his father and from all of his followers who abandoned him in those final moments. The spiritual pain of being tormented by demons as he hung there. The emotional, mental agony of not knowing how long it was going to last or whether we would ever even appreciate that he had done it all for us. This is what he went through out of love of us. It's not a new story. And part of what makes it so difficult for me to get up here and talk to you about the cross tonight is because when I was sitting in your seats as a high school student at Saturday night of a Steubenville Youth Conference, I hadn't experienced a lot of suffering firsthand yet. Um, and, and I know that some of you have. Some of you have been through unbearable pain, imaginable unimaginable losses, things that are unreasonable for someone your age to have gone through already. Your family's fallen apart. One of your parents is not in the picture anymore. Maybe you don't know where your next meal is going to come from. Maybe death has taken someone that you love far too soon. Or maybe your heart's been shattered by someone that you thought you could trust. See, when I was in the seats of a Steubenville Youth Conference as a high school student, I hadn't been through that kind of suffering. You know, I had a really great home. My parents loved each other. They were happily married. They still are. I knew I was getting a great education. I had food to eat and clothes to wear and a car to drive. I knew I was going to go to college. I was going to go on to get a job. It was all just kind of taken for granted that everything was going to be fine. And some of you are there too, and praise God for it. But if we live our lives long enough... The suffering is going to come. It's going to be a part of all of our stories. Belief in God, it doesn't protect us from any and all hurts and pains. See, some people think that's what the faith is all about, that a good God would never let bad things happen to good people. But the central tenet of our faith is that the worst thing happened to the best person. And then horrible things happened to most of his first century followers. And Pope Francis, who probably has a better view of the worldwide church than anyone else, has said more than once that there are more Christian martyrs in our time than there have been at any other time in history. Suffering is going to be a part of our stories. It's not a threat. <laughs> it's a promise. If your heart has never been broken before, then to you the message of the gospel is probably about life and more life. And that's true. Jesus did come to bring us life and life abundant. But if your heart has been broken, then you know in a powerful way that the story of the gospel is really about life and death and new life. There's always that new life. There's always that rebirth, but it always comes after death. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. It's not a threat. It's just reality. And he also said that where I am, you may also be. As Christians, as followers of Christ, we are called to go where he goes. Be where he is. And that means following him into some pretty tough stuff. 
to the agony in the garden, to the false imprisonment, the road to Calvary, to the cross. If you haven't been there yet, there will be a time when that's where he's leading. And my time came just about three years ago. I'd met this really amazing man. We'd, I'd fall crazy in love with him, and somehow he fell crazy in love with me, even after the movie incident. And we were engaged to be married. Um, we were surviving a lot of really challenging stuff, like living long distance, several states apart, while planning a wedding and trying to navigate this thing that might happen to you one day called in-laws. Okay? And then we showed up at the altar of our church on August 15th, 2015, which is the Feast of the Assumption, a holy day of obligation. So when you go in a couple of weeks, make sure you pray for us. Okay, great. Uh, and so we are six weeks into our newlywed bliss. And then I found out that I was pregnant. And it's not like it was a total surprise. Okay, we know where babies come from. Uh, but you'll, you might find out. All right, yeah, we, we know what that's about. But I'm not proud to tell you this. But when I saw that positive pregnancy test, I wept. I bawled my eyes out because we weren't ready. It was too soon. We had just gotten married. We just started living in the same city. We're trying to figure out how to be together. We're not ready to invite someone new into this. And suddenly there we were, not two, but three. And it was a Sunday when I found out, and I remember just crying at Mass, when Father held up the host and said, this is my body given up for you. Because I wasn't ready to live that out yet. But I was. I was a mom. It wasn't too much later that I started to get excited. I got used to the idea and then I was thrilled actually. Because this was something that we really did want for our marriage. And there are a lot of marriages that I know that, that don't have it and long for it, right? So, okay, it was a little earlier than we expected, but so what? And we'd had names picked out before we were even engaged. My name's not his. And we started planning our nursery and started figuring out how we're going to tell our families and friends. And then two weeks later, before we had told anybody, I woke up in the morning and I went to the bathroom and I knew that everything was not okay. So we called our doctor in a panic and he prescribed me a medication to try and save our pregnancy. We rushed in for an ultrasound that was inconclusive. There was no heartbeat yet, but it might just be too soon. So we went home, and we hoped, and we prayed, and we begged. And then we came back four days later for another ultrasound where there was no heartbeat still, and there had been no growth. They were positive that I was having a miscarriage. My body just didn't know it yet. And another week passed before our child really did pass. And another month went by before we were able to bury him. And that first day when I woke up and I knew something was wrong, that was the first time in my life that I knew what it meant to be at the cross. I was with him. The anxiety of not knowing what was happening, the confusion, the hurt, the pain, the physical discomfort, I was there. And I didn't want to be, but I was. And I stayed there for months, just camped out at the foot of that cross. Because every new emotion was another scourge on my heart. I remember feeling so guilty because I hadn't wanted this child at first and, and wondering wrongly if it was somehow my fault that we'd lost our baby. Just two weeks after our child passed, we were at a family function. And I was holding my three-month-old nephew. And an unsuspecting relative made comments about how good I looked with a baby in my arms. It was another lash when the social media posts started coming with pregnancy announcements with our due date. Another lash when those babies started being born. Another lash every time they have a birthday. Another lash when my first Mother's Day came and I had no child. If you're there, if you're in the pain, I know. I know how you feel. But our suffering has a purpose. Our suffering is not for nothing. See, death and grief and loss and disappointment and guilt, they're a part of a lot of our stories. They're a part of what we've been through. And that doesn't mean that our God is out to get us. Please hear this so clearly. God does not give us things to handle. God is how we handle the things that are given to us. 
Suffering can be redemptive. It can be an opportunity for grace. Grace for ourselves, grace for others. God wants to take that suffering and turn it into something beautiful. And so often it's what pushes us into his wide open arms, which is where we wanted to be all along. We just didn't know how to get there because we're so busy trying to go about it in our own ways. I know that the suffering that I experienced losing that child is not wasted. Nothing is wasted in the kingdom if we put it into God's hands. Those tears that I cried then, the tears I can still cry today, they're like the tears of the woman at Bethany with the perfumed oil who broke it open and poured it out and washed his feet with them. And I know that the tears that I cry in my grief, they're washing his feet in the people I serve. It's not wasted, not one second of my suffering, not one second of his, not one second of yours. He works all things for our good. And the cross and the resurrection, they're so much closer than we think. I don't know if anyone here has ever been to the Holy Land before. Me neither. Okay, so I have a friend who went recently and she told me something crazy beautiful. She said the sight of the crucifixion and the sight of the resurrection are actually physically a lot closer than you would expect. Um, You might think that it's kind of a distance, but they actually fit inside the same church. It's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the big dome that you see there, that's the site of the crucifixion. That's where our Lord died. And the smaller dome you see there, that's the site of the resurrection. That's where he rose from the dead. So you can sit and pray at the place where he died and sit and pray at the place where he rose from the dead without ever stepping outside. They're so much closer than we think they are. And part of the reason why it's so hard for us to understand this, this amazing thing that our God did for us is because our English language, it's very limited. Okay, We have this one word, time, and we expect it to encompass a lot of reality. Um, But the Greeks actually have it better. They have two words for time. They have the word chronos and the word kairos. Now chronos, that's the kind of measured time that we live in, okay, minutes, seconds, days. Uh, Sometimes living in chronos is awesome, right? Like when you get three months off school for summer vacation. It's pretty great, right, Uh, yeah. Or my personal favorite, now that I don't get summer vacation, uh, when it's fall, daylight savings time, and that clock rolls back an hour and I get to sleep more. That's my favorite, okay? Yeah, sometimes living in Kronos is awesome. Sometimes living in Kronos is the worst. Like when you're running late and you hit every single red light along the way, right? Yeah. Or when that spring daylight savings rolls around, it's so cruel and it rolls back and you lose that hour of sleep, okay? Whether we love it or hate it, we live in it. Kronos is our reality. But God lives in Kairos, And that reality is very different. See, Kairos is the unmeasured time where God is. So that's kind of hard to wrap our brains around, right? But here's the deal. God created everything, including time, including space. So so time is not subject to God. Excuse me. God is not subject to time, but time is subject to him. And he can move in and out of it however he wants, whenever he wants. It's a crazy concept that's so hard to understand But it means that the cross and the resurrection, they're so much closer than 2,000 years ago. They're so much closer than being three days apart. They're so much closer than fitting inside the same church. It means they're happening at the exact same time for God. God is on the cross right now. And God is resurrected right now. And God is right here, right now, all at once. God is in all times, at all times He's so much bigger than we think, and his biggest priority is to be where we are. This scripture that we've been breaking down all weekend from John, 1 John, in this way the love of God was revealed to us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might have life through him. It ends with a promise. He's conquered sin, he's conquered death, he's conquered time, he's conquered space, He has come for us to have abundant life. He stepped out of Kairos and into Kronos for us. And there's a good reason that Kronos is so difficult for us to live in. Uh, C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, among many other brilliant things, yeah. He has this section in one of his books where he asks the question, do you think that fish ever complain about being wet? 
Well, no, right? You can't imagine a fish sitting there being like, gosh, I'd really like to dry off, you know? No, fish don't complain about being wet because fish were created to live in water. But have you ever found yourself complaining about time? Yeah, how is the summer already halfway over? Oh my gosh, this week is taking forever. I can't believe we go home tomorrow. We complain about time all the time because we weren't made for time. Human beings made in God's image and likeness, we have these eternal souls. They were created for heaven, created for kairos. That's the reason why Kronos is so unsatisfying. We were made for that place where we get to be with him forever. And that's exactly why Jesus came. Because where he is, he wants us to be. See, when Jesus was born, in the beginning he was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Jesus died and rose from the dead, in the end, the last thing he said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven was, Behold, I am with you always. In the beginning and in the end, he is with us always. Our God is not limited to time and space, but he wants to be with us every single step of the way. Whether we are on the cross or in the tomb or resurrected in the garden, he wants to be where we are. We've heard the story of the cross so often that we forget that it all comes down to a relationship, okay? Jesus died and rose again so that we could be with him, so that we could be with the Father. It's about reconciliation. It's about reunion. It's about being together. Death can't keep us apart anymore. Nobody wants to go to the cross, but it's going to happen. We will all encounter the cross in our lives, and it's a part of the story of how he's turning us into saints, Losing our first child, that was an invitation for me to draw near the cross. And in my greatest suffering, in my greatest pain, I know that he was with me. He was in our doctor's office. He was in our home. He was on the cross all at the same time. But he was resurrected too. I just couldn't see it then, but I know it now. He is in all times, at all times. Suffering, it's a moment in time, but victory is what lasts. There is no hurt, no pain, no heartbreak in this world that Jesus cannot overcome, that he will not overcome, that he has not overcome. He's not limited, right? In this world, we will have trouble, but he has conquered the world, and he is with us always. He promised, and he always keeps his promises. Tonight, he's here. Tonight, Jesus himself will physically be in this room because he's not bound to time and space. And there is nowhere that he won't go to be where you are. Not even into a little piece of bread carried around an arena on a Saturday night in Springfield, Missouri. There's no limits to his love. Tonight, in the midst of the 5,000, he is coming for you. He wants to be with you. You, tonight, is just an example of him being exactly who he is. He's with us always. On the altar this morning at Mass, he went to the cross again for us. So that tonight he could come and be with us in the glory of his resurrection. It's all part of the cycle of life and death that he endures over and over again for us. Death on that altar at the mass, resurrection and glory in our adoration of him tonight, death again tomorrow morning at the mass. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He makes himself small just to show off how big he really is, bigger than suffering, bigger than time, hurt, pain, space, bigger than any of it. Tonight, we get to step out of Kronos and into Kairos. Tonight, all of heaven is going to come into this place with all its angels and all its saints and all its victories. Tonight, we get to be with him. We get to be with all of them. Tonight, you get to meet my kid. So we all get to be here together. As heaven enters this room, We're not stepped in Kronos anymore. We go into Kairos. We get a taste of heaven every single time Jesus draws near. Tonight he comes to reveal himself to you in a new way. 
Maybe it's on the cross. It's absolutely in the resurrection. I don't know where you need the victory in your life, but God does. And tonight he is coming to make it happen. Tonight is about the victory of knowing that he is ours and we are his and there are no limits to the love that he has for us. Our God is with us always, in all times, at all times, right here, right now, tonight. Let's pray.